François Verhappel. So, uh, let me do this uh, lecture. Uh, let's start with some uh, plan and some reminders. So, we have done uh, up to now basically a review of the basics of two dimensional CFT. And uh, let me remind some very important uh, results, well, results we will use today. So, first, we have this uh, degenerate uh, fusion product of representations of the Virasora algebra. So, we know that when we fuse a uh, um, degenerate representation, which has a vanishing null vector of level 2 here, like R21, with any Verma module, we'll find a sum of two terms. So, two other Verma modules, and we know the momentums of these two Verma modules. This uh, must apply also to operator product expansions of the corresponding fields, of course. So, this uh, fusion rule of representation is, is a way, a simple way to encode uh, constraints on operator product expansion. And then we move to non carol CFT, meaning to copying the left uh, moving Virasor algebra with the right moving Virasor algebra. So fields now have a left and a right conformal dimension. And we have extra constraints that come with that. I mean, the constraint that our collection functions basically are single values. And in particular, we could derive uh, the two point function. I mean, based on the conformal symmetry, we had a, a undetermined refactor called the two point structure constant, B here. And we have a factor completely determined by conformal symmetry starting with the delta function, which obliges the conformal dimension of these two fields to be the same, both on the left and on the right, and then a dependence on z, which is, well, this is what it is. And here I'm using my infamous modulus squared notation, which is not really the complex uh, modulus squared, but it just means taking this quantity and multiplying with the same quantities with bars, except that z bar is the complex conjugate of z, but delta bar is not the complex conjugate of delta. It is just uh, the right dimension, the right moving dimension. Okay, so based on this uh, on these results and ideas, we can start really constructing uh, exactly solvable body CFT. Uh, but um, before doing that in examples, I I started with some structural uh, generality. Uh, in particular about the spectrum. So I was trying to define the various types of, of spectrums we can have. And well, one important uh, object is the OP spectrum. So when you do an OP of two fields here, so let S1 to be the, the set of primary fields which appear in this OP. And um, well, we want the or the spectrum of our CFT to be closed under OPEs, meaning that if um, I and J belong to the, the biggest of the spectrum, the whole set of the field in our CFT um, of primary field, and we, we want any SIJ also to be included in this set. So we do an OP of two fields, of course, which will remain inside our CFT. But then if this allows us to define uh, extended spectrum. So long as we, as this uh, condition is still obeyed, we can add extra fields, uh, but we have to add whatever comes out of their operator product expansions. Okay, so are there questions uh, about that? So if, if not, um, let's uh, discuss a bit more um, which uh, fields we want to in our model. So we start with a degenerate field. Um, well, but before that, I have to uh, actually mention an important point, which is the, and to define what is, what are diagonal fields. Um, so based in particular on this two point function, uh, if we want this two point function to be single valued, we have a constraint now on the on the dimension. So the left and the right dimension, so they are different, which is called the conformal field. 
So it has to be half integral. So when I'm building a, a field, I have to satisfy this condition. And well, the simplest way to satisfy it is probably that if their dimensions are equal. So a field which has equal depth and right dimensions is called a thin depth field. Well, a field whose thin is zero. Um, well, sometimes in the literature it's called a diagonal field, but now I want to define a slightly different uh, type of diagonal field. So, because the Desmet fields play a very important role in, in exactly solvable CFTs, um, so what matters is not just that the spins are equal on the left and on the right, but also if they remain equal after I'm doing an OP with some Desmet field. So let's say that um, if um, V is spin depth, but also if in this OP of some, any degenerate field, in fact, with V, I find only spin depth primaries. Then, uh, by definition, I am calling V diagonal. The, 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 things, uh, with the degenerate Vs, they are not chiral, they are... Well, for the moment, I mean, we'll see in an instant. I mean, we will assume that they are, in fact, uh, diagonal themselves. But the, the, if not, if you have little chances to find the spinless fields on the right, is it? Isn't it? Right. Okay. Complete now. I mean, it's, it's no no more the Carroll uh, fusion rule. Which, uh, yeah. Now I'm talking about really the fields, so which have a left and a right dimension. Um, so there, there is this slight uh, subtlety between spinless and diagonal. Um, okay, but it doesn't really affect the definition of a diagonal CFT. So a CFT is diagonal, it's all primary field. Uh, are spin based. Or diagonal. I mean it's equivalent to know that all of them are spinless or all of them diagonal. Okay, so diagonal CFTs are, well, are there simple, so we start, in fact, when, we, when it comes to building examples, we start with diagonal CFTs, which are moving to non-diagonal CFTs. Okay, so now which field uh, do we allow in our CFT? So we start with the degenerate field. And by degenerate, I mean diagonal and degenerate. So a field... Uh, which belongs to a degenerate representation here on the left, but also the same degenerate representation on the right. So, let's see, this is in our field, in the first column, and the representation of the conformal algebra then. Okay, so these fields are supposed to exist for uh, R and S. Uh, positive integer, I mean, um, and well, the central charge for the moment is anything, and uh, they are conformal dimensions, left and right. Well, by definition, they are delta R S and delta R S, the same on the left and on the right. So next, which other types of fields do we have? Well, there is a distinction between fully degenerate and degenerate fields. So let me mention the fully degenerate fields, the SRS. Well, they belong to fully degenerate representations, of course. So the distinction between uh, degenerate and uh, fully degenerate and makes sense only when the central charge is, uh, is is rational, when beta squared is rational, in fact. 
because this is a necessary condition for having several uh, null vectors in the same representation. So if I have several, I can decide if one of them vanishes or maybe all of them vanish. So all of them means it's fully degenerate, and if only one of them vanishes, I have a just a degenerate uh, tree. So again, the conformal dimensions on the left and on the right are the same. And R and S are still integral. Okay, so then uh, let me define a diagonal field here, uh, Vp, labeled by its momentum. So momentum is related to the conformal dimension by this formula. So this one would have the dimension, so C minus 1 over 24 plus integral, both on the left and on the right. So at the moment, uh, P is any complex number. And so this field belongs to the Verman module on the left and on the right. Okay, and finally, let me introduce a uh, um, non-diagonal field. So all, all these fields so far are diagonal. Um, so the non-diagonal field, so now the non-trivial point is that instead of labeling them with their left and right dimension, I want to label them by indices R and S, such that the left dimension is delta Rs and the right dimension is delta R minus S. Um, so I'm allowed to do that because I mean they, they depend on two numbers, the left and the right dimensions, and I'm allowed to rewrite these two numbers instead of two other parameters, these cat indices R and S. So these parameters for the for the moment are just any complex number. And this is a notation which will be very convenient as we will soon discover. Um, and then my uh, non diagonal fields uh, belong to, in general, to the Roma module. V delta R S times V bar delta R minus S. Well, there are exceptions to that, but I mean, if R and S are, let's say, if R and S are integral, and non zero integral, then, well, in one of these uh, Verma modules, you will find some null vectors, and then you have to decide if they vanish or not. So the structure can be more complicated in these cases, but in general, it's just very Okay, so these are the fields from which we want to build some non-trivial and unsolvable uh, CFTs. So let me say a bit more on the non-diagonal fields. So in particular, I mean, it's important that the spin uh, is half integral for single diagonalness. What is the spin of the non-diagonal field? So that delta Rx minus delta R minus S. So let's call it Srs. So which is P squared Rs minus P squared R minus S, which is, well, P, so the, Okay, let me do this calculation. PRS minus PR minus S. PRS plus PR minus S, which is P um, 0 to S, P 2R 0, which is minus RS. Okay, so, so the spin of a uh, non uh, non diagonal field is just the product of these two indices, and this we want to be cast integral. Okay, and then let me just point out that this parametrization of field is a bit redundant because I'm using here the momentum in particular P, but the conformal dimension is P squared. So we have relations like 
dp equals b minus c, but sometimes it's convenient to allow for non-trivial reflection coefficient rp. And similarly, in general, we have well, v r s equals v minus r minus s. Just a number, R. Sorry, R and S. R P. Ah, R P. Yeah, it's just a number. It should not depend on Z. It's not a phi. It's uh, yeah. It's called the reflection coefficient. Well. Okay. So the next question is uh, so so now you could have several fields with the same uh, phi in your theory, isn't it? So then you could imagine having a matrix or whatever. Or right. So it, it could be that, uh, that my fields are not completely defined by the conformal dimension. I would need to add extra indices or something to distinguish fields with the same dimension. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with the diagonal field. So which diagonal field will we have and how many we will, will we have? So we want. Um, our um, spectrum to be a stable when closed on the OPs. So if I start, for example, with V12, and then I'm doing OPs. So when we, we know what, what is the, the fusion product of R12 with itself, so it, give, it gives us R11 plus R13. Uh, so V12, V12, well, it can contain V11 plus V13. So, in fact, we assume that both of them are there for the moment. So, everything that's allowed, let's say, by the fusion roots here, appears actually in the OPs. So, if that's the case, then if I do repeated OPs of V12 with itself, I will generate a family of, uh, of um, diagonal fields. So, Let's say from V12 alone, I would generate, in fact, all the V1R with any R, uh, uh, V1S, sorry, with so an infinite family of designated fields. Well, if I started with the trivial field V11, I would just uh, keep with V11, which would fuse it to itself. Can it also contain something non diagonal, which looks like 1 1 on the left and 1 3 on the right? Um, no, in fact, in, in, in general, not. Uh, but um, so first, I, have, I can get only something degenerate, because degenerate field is used to other degenerate fields. And um, and right, if you okay. if you try to have v11 on the left and v13 on the right, the spin in general is uh, is anything. Well, it depends on the central charge. So it sounds like we're trying to find the entropy. Yeah, right. It could happen. Accidents could happen. So here I'm assuming the central charge is generic and there is no accident. So using degenerate diagonal fields, I only get degenerate diagonal fields. Okay, so from V12, I generate all these. So if I start with V13, well, I, I would generate, um, again, an infinite family of fields, but only with odd indices now. So fusing odd, I mean, odd with odd remains odd. Or I could, now I could have several degenerate fields. I could start with V12 and V21. And then I would generate the whole set of designated fields. So there are not, there are only seven possibilities actually, uh, modulo the exchange of RNS. Yes? Sorry for the weird question, but are we, maybe I missed it, so uh, the spin is, is quantized? So is that so far an assumption or are we thinking of motivating that in terms of some symmetry? Right? Like sometimes you say, okay, modular invariance imposes spin quantization. 
So uh, the, the motivation yeah. is single validness of collection functions. Okay. So it's an assumption that you can relax, okay. but I mean, we don't really want to relax it. Okay, no, no, it's good. So single validness imposes spin quantization. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, I was in the process of enumerating basically the families of uh, degenerate fields that are closed on the fusion, and, uh, and there are in fact only seven families modulo R, modulo the exchange of R and F. So here are four families, and if you, I mean, the remaining families, they would be generated by V12, maybe, and V31. That's when the second index is anything, but the first has to be odd. Or you could have V13 and V31. And uh, one to three. Oh, I'm missing one family here. Um, wait. Yeah, I'm missing a trivial family for a reason because they need the zero fields. So it, is, it doesn't look about this are an answer to which question exactly? Well, what is the set of uh, degenerate fields in our CFT? So we, we, have, we, have, a we have to pick one of these we seven. Have, we have a CFT, which we have that has at least one degenerate field. Yeah, so, but in fact, we'll work with only two possibilities. Mm -hmm. no? When you act on VRS with this degenerate V12 or V21, you you remain in this RS in the in the class of uh, computer. Well, that's a very good question, but we are. Uh, I mean, you mean no, non-diagonal fields? Yes. No. Yeah, 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 but we are not there yet. So first, we we determine which diagonal which degenerate fields exist, and then we'll see what happens if you fuse it with some other field. There is no V1. It, it's not possible to avoid having V12 or V13. Yeah, right. Same as this, this in the RSB and there is no condition. Right, if you start with some VRS with high R and F and you start to, let's say if S is uh, odd, you end up with uh, V13 basically. Mm -hmm. And if it's even, you would... Yeah, by doing that, you would see it. It's just the same with the spin. I mean, if you start the spin, you right. can have half integer spins or integer spins, they remain together. But then if you start with the two high spins, you will create the, the, all of the ones that are downstairs. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so for, for us, we will really uh, work with two possibilities. So, CFT with two diagonal fields, uh, with two, sorry, degenerate fields. So by definition, this is a, a CFT which contains V21 and V12. And therefore, in fact, all the possible uh, degenerate fields. And CFT with one degenerate field, by definition, we take it to be V12. Um, no, of course, there is the other possibility that it could be V13 here instead of V12, but it doesn't matter so much. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not assuming these fields are in the physical spectrum, I'm only assuming they exist, so they are in the, let's say, some extended spectrum. I still don't quite understand your previous answer, so it, it, it's just because some V is all by representation here to appear in the OP of two fields, it doesn't mean that it actually appears, right? It doesn't mean the three-point function is not zero. Yeah, right, you're right, but I'm um, I'm assuming it appears, so it's a new, a new axiom. I, I'm allowed to add axioms as I go, basically. So there could be, in principle, CFTs that only have some VRS with high R and S and no, no small like... Yeah, yeah, no yeah, yeah, it's considerable. Uh, um, and to some extent it exists if you use the E series with my model. But I won't talk about that. So indeed, my axioms apply to some class of CFT, and as always, if you relax, then um, you can get more. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the existence of these degenerate fields will really determine the structure of our CFT. So, 
it has even been proposed that uh, you should add this degeneracy to the symmetry algebra. So our, our symmetry algebra for the moment is made of um, the conformal algebra made of Dirac to left and Dirac to right. So if you want it generated by the left and the right energy momentum tensors, but the suggestion is that we could define an intercarol algebra where it would add maybe u one two to this uh, symmetry generator. So you would consider it a symmetry generator. Well, so the intercarol algebra is not really an algebra, but uh, the ideology is that it plays the same role as an extended uh, symmetry algebra. Um, in fact, you can even def define intercarol conformal blocks by summing a series of uh, Dirac-Toro blocks. Um, so I will not use this intercarol language, um, but I just uh, mentioned that it exists. Well, because this uh, V12 is not carol, it's the uh, same on the left and on the right. <coughs> Okay, so now the next question is to what happens if I do, if I have some di diagonal field, say VP, and I'm doing an OPE with, let's say, V12. Um, so, by the fusion roots, which are still there, I can get how many, do you think I can get uh, how many fields maximum I could I get? Well, in fact, four. Because uh, the, the fusion roots apply on the left and also on the right. So I could get some field with the left moment in P minus delta 2 and right moment 2. Well, here it could be P plus minus and on the right also P plus minus. And so it's one of the two. I have these four possibilities. But now I have to look at the uh, conformal spins of this field. So, well, first I have fields which are themselves diagonal, so vp plus minus 1 over 2 beta. By this, I really mean one of these fields with the same uh, dimension on the left and on the right. In which case, I have no problem, the spin is zero. But I could also have fields, so the other two fields, they are not diagonal. And in fact, their spin typically is, uh, is not half integral, so I have to eliminate them. So in fact, I only have these two terms. And similarly, if I do this of E, I must get just these two terms. Okay, then uh, let's uh, mention what, what Vincent was asking for the, the non diagonal sheets. So V12, VRS. Equals what? So how many possibilities do we expect? Well, again, four. Uh, two on the left and two on the right. So now the trick is to write these four possibilities again in, in this notation. And if you do that, you'll find the two possibilities of this type are S plus or minus one, and two possibilities of this type, V, R plus or minus beta minus T S. So let's say for the moment these are just possibilities. It has to be included in this. So now can we allow all these things to appear? So we have to look at their conformal spins. Um, and in fact, more precisely, we look at the difference between the spins on the right and the spin on the left, because all of them have to be half integral. So the spin of this field, let's say s plus 1, minus spin rs, well, it's pretty easy to um, compute if you remember that the spin rs is just minus rs. So the spin difference uh, could be minus r. And then the spin difference for uh, the other one, plus beta minus 2, uh, s minus r s, it should be minus s beta minus 2. So if we wanted all these four fields to uh, 
here, we would need that R is fast integer, S theta minus Q is fast integer, and also Rs is fast integer. Well, if you combine these three uh, conditions, you'll find that beta minus Q has to be rational. Right? Because beta minus Q, yeah? S should be in the S beta minus two. Well, maybe let me let me do it. Uh, well, basically, or maybe you just remark R is is rational. R S is rational, so S is also rational, and then S beta minus two is is rational, so beta minus two is rational as well. But we don't want that. I mean, we want to keep uh, beta squared generic. And so this basically this forces us to choose between these terms and these terms. And this choice is just a matter of convention, but of course my conventions are that this is the simplest formula, so we eliminate these terms. And we are left with V12 uh, equals sum V R uh, R S plus or minus one. And similarly the B21 VRS equal to VR plus minus one. Yes, if you have, could you imagine a conformative theory for which you would even decide that R is not a half integer? R RS is a half integer, and so your case VRS is fine, but R is not a half integer or whatever, so you have nothing in the, in the right. Um, yeah, probably it should not be a very interesting conformative theory, but you can imagine it. Yes. Well, it's, it's a generic case, isn't it? Well, if you have nothing, it means basically that it decouples. So your fit V12, if it decouples, it's as if it was not there. So fine. So, so then you get the CFT, but without the unit fit, with current technology, you, can't, you can do little. But When you add this plus, it, it, it means it doesn't necessarily have this here in the in the in the, in the fusion rules. I mean. Yeah, it doesn't. It, it means they are the only simple rules. You don't need plus. But now I'm also assuming that they do occur. Uh, this one. Well, it's doing the same exercise, but B, with B21 instead oh, of B2. Oh, B21, okay. Yeah, B2 I, I, I don't know. I thought it was. Okay, and uh, let me remark also that um, by allowing these fields, I also got some conditions on, on R. So here, R has to be half integer, and here it says it has to be half integer. Also want spin to be half measure, so also S. Yeah, indeed, I also want the spin, so I want here, I still want Rs to be half integer, but this allows S, the second index, to be fractional. And here we start to see the spectrum of, uh, let's say, the POTS model or the ON model to emerge. Why do you insist on working in generic data? Is it one of the most most interesting models have a very specific beta, which is often actually rational or beta squared. Yeah, so that's a good question. Though the point is that rational uh, values of beta squared are uh, very hard. So you get all these possible complications because now we possibly have more terms in these types of OPEs, but it depends on the values of the parameters, which terms you have. So everything gets more complicated. So the ideology here is that uh, we work at generic central charge. And then if we are interested in specific model, like percolation, we'll take a limit. And the complications will appear in the limit. Can you imagine you have models that where you can follow beta continuously? Right, I, I want beta to be a continuous parameter. It's the case, in fact, in the, let's say, POTS, ON models and all these loop models. 
And in fact, yeah, even the structure of representations is, is much more complicated for Russian and beta squares because you can have several null vectors, in fact, infinitely many null vectors in the same Verma module. So everything is simpler than in the genome space. You can recover this uh, this fact from representation theory by taking a limit for a continuous beta? Uh, essentially, yes. So uh, at least uh, uh, today we, if we plan to recover the fusion rules of minimal models from the generic uh, beta fusion rules. Okay. So you can take beta, let's say, such that the cent suppose you take central charge larger than one, generic, Oh well, just generic, and then you know by setting it to a specific value of the minimal model as a limit, you can recover the fusion rules of minimal models. Yeah, that's what we'll do later. Yeah. So could it happen that what you crossed somehow suddenly happens when you go to a rational value of beta? Yeah, it can come back, but typically it will come back from elsewhere in the spectrum, in a sense. Yes. So can you explain? Why it doesn't matter what exactly you cross when you cross uh, the cross term? Well, th these two terms are incompatible because if I assume both of them, I it implies that beta. Yeah, 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 but, it, yeah so but you said that it doesn't matter which one. Right, it's uh, it's really a matter of convention, in fact. But just because if I choose only one term, I it, it can happen for well, generic beta squared, so uh, I'm fine. In ex in external choices of that kind, it's unclear for me that you couldn't do one choice in for one fusion rule and another choice for another one. Right. So this is an extra exercise which uh, which can be done. But indeed, these these two choices, if you want, are compatible. But uh, they are also correlated. Okay, so uh, now let's do let's go slightly further. So we, we know that R is half integer, and then um, let's look a bit more at this OPE. So in this OPE we have if now if we take the field at V and the other field at zero, we have uh, coefficients here depend which depend on V. So V to um, well, the, let's say delta r x plus one. If you consider the first term is its sum minus delta one two minus delta r x, and we have a d bar delta r minus f minus one minus delta one two minus delta r x and d r x plus one. So let me just, I'm just considering this term. And then I want to look at the monodromy of V1 to around, around zero. So the monodromy is, is determined by the spin. So the difference of this dimension is determined by this spin difference, S R S plus one minus basically S R S. So here it's a minus S. Uh, when well this we computed already, it's uh, minus um, R, which means that the monodromy here is e to the two pi i R. So this can be one or minus one. So if R is half integer, we have a non-trivial monodromy, which means the correlation function is not really single value; it's double value. So let's say that's fine. That's a reasonable uh, relaxation of our axioms. Um, however, if we consider uh, n, some endpoint function, V R i is i, and then we make V one two go over go around all the other fields, well, the product of all the monodromies must be one. And so product two e to the two pi r i is one. So this implies, uh, well, let me write it here, that r 
to the sum of the R's should be uh, integer. So basically R is, it can be half integer, but it has to be conserved modulo integer. And similarly, in the second situation, the index F will be conserved modulo integer. Okay, so uh, to finish uh, this, uh, well, this generalities about uh, solvable DST, I want to say something on the on the convergence convergence of opinion. So, um, so let, let's imagine we have uh, some opinion v1 v2 equals the sum over the spectrum of primary field v k. So for this to converge. Basically, we want the conformal dimension of these fields to be bounded from below. So, more precisely, we want the if over this spectrum of the real part of delta k plus delta bar k to be well, more than minus infinity. Okay, but now if we have this field V12, and if we have fields, some fields of non diagonal field VRS, well, by doing repeated OPEs, I will get values F plus L, let's say, or L, well, some, some any, in fact, any um, integral number. So I will get this infinite. A sequence of fields. So uh, what I mean is I will get VR S plus L. So in this infinite sequence, I want the total conformal dimension to be bounded from below. And to, well, I have to compute it. So delta, so the conformal dimension of a non-diagonal field is delta R S plus delta R minus S. And from these formulas, you can you can compute it, so t minus 1 over 12 plus 1 half r squared beta squared plus s squared beta minus 2. And now we see that the second index L, well, it can go to real infinity, basically. So s squared can go to plus infinity. And so if I want this to be bounded from below, I have to assume the real part of beta minus 2 to be positive. Well, that's equivalent to real part of beta squared positive, or in terms of the central charge, real part of C less than 13. And so this is a very basic universal consistency constraint on CFTs that have non diagonal fields and uh, definite fields. And these constraints, I think, explains why it's hard to find um, solvable CFTs at large central charge, meaning a central charge close to plus infinity. And that's a problem for well, applying these uh, CFTs to quantum gravity in particular. Any questions on that? Yeah, not we, we, I guess uh, maybe just a question on one thing. You wouldn't really expect in a large single charge to have a degenerate field anyway because it wouldn't be unit for, for large. But for C greater than one, in a unitary theory, you cannot have a large field. Right. Uh, but uh, the point is that it can belong to the extended spectrum. So you don't really care about unitarity. For example, this uh, degenerate field is present in UV theory. And UV theory exists also at large central charge. So what saves UV theory is that it's diagonal, so you don't have this particular problem. Okay, so let's start building actual conformal field theories. And the first one is 
the generalized minimal model. Well, why I'm starting with something which is generalized instead of um, saying? Um, well, it's because <laughs> generalized minimal models are actually much simpler than minimal models. But uh, they happen to be uh, constructed later because, uh, well, first they are non-rational, so infinitely many primary fields. And second, uh, well, their torus partial function uh, does not exist. So when people were looking at modulant and torus partial functions, they didn't find them. But to construct them, you only have to assume that the spec ink is made of all diagonal degenerate fields. And basically, that's it. I mean, you have your, your CFTs. Uh, you know that these fields are closed under P's, so this obeys our basic constraint. So the second basic constraint here well, that is in fact not true for the whole spectrum, but you don't really care because in any OP you have finitely many terms. So, well, let me rewrite. So, these OPEs here it's VBR1 S1, VBR2 S2 equals sum for R from R1 minus R2 plus 1, R1 plus R2 minus 1, S from S1 minus S2 plus 1, S1 plus S2 minus 1. This sums run by increments of 2, V, R, S. So any OP is in fact a, fi a sum of finitely many terms. So, well, plus dissonance, of course. But so you don't have to worry about convergence. Ah, so here I'm in the process of sketching all these CFTs, so structure constants are for a la later lecture. So indeed, then you have to work out structure constants. So is the claim that they are, un they are unique? Is, is it assumed to take the spectrum? Yeah, right. The claim is they are unique, and we can, in fact, compute them. But uh, this lecture is about uh, sketching basically all the CFTs that plausibly exist. You could also you could also put the multiplicity, right? This is a very strange spectrum where for each R and S you only have one view. Right. Well, I suspect that this would boil down to the same thing or to several copies of the same thing because you see, the, precisely the spectral constants are unique. So even if you have, if you want to add multiplicity, you'll end up to have the same correlation functions independent of the multiplicity. Well, yeah, that's a bit quick. It would maybe deserve more uh, more study if someone is motivated. <laughs> but not just in generate minimal models, in fact. OK, so after this uh, quick and easy victory, let's uh, construct the real theory. And for that, we'll start with the generalized minimal model and assume the beta squared is a real, positive, and non rational. And, okay, why am I doing this particular assumption? Well, you will understand if you look at the values of the, of the momentum here for the field for all these degenerate fields. So the momentum here is. PRS with R and S um, integers. So now with this assumption, I can assume beta is real. And even positive if I want. And if you look at these momentums, well, they all fall on some line, on the real line. So I'm in the complex P plane, but this is the real line. And here I have the vector beta, and here the vector beta minus 1. So beta minus 1 goes in the same direction as beta. That's the assumption uh, here that beta squared is positive. And if you look at all these uh, values, PRS, 
Now I have this crucial minus sign, and therefore I'm claiming these values are dense in the in the real line. So, uh, in mathematical terms, I'm claiming the closure of the set of C R S. is the whole real line. So I want to use this to construct diagonal fields here by taking limit of my degenerate fields and sending Rs to infinity such that Prs go to some peak here, which can be any real number. So if I do that, uh, the null vector here, which is at level Rs, uh, will go to level infinity, so maybe it disappears. And I'm getting a diagonal field, which is no longer degenerate. So, with this limit, uh, the claim is that uh, uh, the limit of the, of the spec pool, well, it, it gives me just the spec pool Vp, or real p. So let me put a one half here because um, of the redundant redundancy between p and minus p. That would be the spec room of the real theory, which for the moment has a tensor charge less than one because of this uh, restriction. Well, in fact, it's not not all valid less than one because it's, I also assume beta squared to be non-rational. But then I can take a limit in beta squared and since I can get all simple charges less than one. So all real positive beta squared. Okay, so if we accept that uh, Jarre's minimal models exist, so basically we, we get that this new real theory must exist as well as a limit. Um, so what is this operator product expansion? Um, so we take this P1 P2, and then we have to take the limit of this operator product expansion. And well, all the indices basically go to infinity. So if you look at it, you see that here you get any momentums essentially. So we used to have seven possible families of the degenerate fields. Uh, Right, so we could try to construct all the CFTs with fewer degenerate fields. So here, I mean, uh, I'm assuming we have all degenerate fields for the moment. Okay, we can in principle imagine a generalized minimal model with just a PRS for R, odd, R even and S. Uh, Sure, yeah, right. We could do that. And if you do that, well, it's a sub-model if you want. So it's all included in the in the in the general minimal model. Yeah, exactly. yeah sorry, uh, what is the one half there? So one half is because uh, Vp is the same as V minus V. So when I'm writing all real numbers, it's redundant. Okay. Okay, so now I'm taking the OPE by, by taking a limit of this OPE, and uh, when it becomes continuous, it becomes an integral. So I have the same one half, by the way, and I get, naively, I get this. Well, I say naively, which means I don't really get this. So why don't I really get this? Uh, well, the problem is that, okay, that, that's fine when, as far as primary fields are concerned, but you must remember that it all comes with descendants for some of the descendants. And then these descendants come from coefficients, come with coefficients. So I have some coefficients f delta L, delta one, delta two, and then this LVP, let's say. And this coefficient, if you remember, it has poles. It has poles when the uh, conformal dimension delta here becomes degenerate. Uh, but now, um, precisely the, the real line here over which I'm integrating is exactly where the degenerate fields live. I mean, that's how we got this new theory in the first place by taking a limit from the degenerate fields, which live all over this line, which are dense in this line. And that's how we constructed our 
it's dagger than field. And so, in principle, I have this uh, dense set of single, uh, simple poles in this uh, in this coefficient in this integral. And the trick then is that when I'm computing this OPE, I should actually shift uh, the integration line. So VP1, VP2 is in fact one half R plus I epsilon VP. So the integration line will will be this one now. And it will avoid all the singularities. So, but now to do that, I have to assume that I have some VP with complex values of the momentum, which uh, if you want, I'm assuming by saying this is an extended spectrum. So the, the extended spectrum of this uh, UV theory would include all the VP with complex with complex moment. Can you can I in principle derive this contour prescription with the plus i epsilon by carefully taking the limit of the generalized minimal model of e? Uh, yeah, so that would be nice indeed to but uh, I I have not tried and I don't know if it's possible. The the, the way we derived this prescription was by guessing basically. So we guessed, and then we checked crossing symmetry numerically. So that was work with around from Takara in 2015. So minus i epsilon would uh, blow up. No, so minus i epsilon would, do, would, would give you the same result due to the symmetry between p and minus p. Also, maybe it would, well, maybe you will see it in the descendants, but if you look at just at the primaries, you have the feeling that, in fact, the OP of VP1 and VP2 doesn't depend on P1 and P2. No, but here is a risk schematic notation, but you have, a, well, first of all, you have a, a structure constant here, C, P, P1, P2. Right. Yeah, and then you have the dependency as well. Okay, so we have UV theory with C less than one, but uh, what about UV theory with a more general value of C? I mean, after all, originally UV theory was constructed from pass integral for P bigger than 25, and then it can be continued analytically to C complex, essentially. Well, except in fact this line, minus infinity one. So now we are starting from the opposite direction. We are starting from C less than one. Can we recover? By analytic continuation in C, can we recover the UV theory for more general complex charge? Um, well, we could try at least, but in fact, this would fail. And the reason is, again, these poles here. So these poles here, they fit on this line. Um, these poles, which appear in this OP, they, they fit on the line, but that's true only for C less than one. As soon as C leaves this path line, what happens is that the pole, they start to form two wedges here. So they are like this and some uh, lattice. And then there is an uh, upper lattice as well. So suddenly you have poles which uh, jump off the line and then they start to, to go until infinity, in fact. I mean, these are infinite wedges. So whatever you do, you cannot keep this line far enough. It will always get crossed by infinitely many poles. And this prevents you from uh, continuing analytically from C less than 1. So there is no, an, no analytic continuation. And therefore, if I want to define UV theory uh, for general values of the center charge, all I can do for the moment is to assume it exists. So I'm defining basically spectrum to be, well, the same spectrum, one half of the set of VP real P. And I'm assuming the OPE to be, well, VP1, VP2 equals one half integral. 
where now the integrality really over is, is over only real momentum because the poles have moved off in the complex plane, so I don't need to shift the contour anymore. I, I don't have any more hold on my integration map. But nevertheless, I could still define an extended spectrum. In fact, I could define the extended spectrum of UV to contain all complex momentum. So that still works uh, by analytic continuation in P. Uh, I could even add in the spectrum all the designate fields if I want, which would in fact make the generalized minimal model a subsector of UV theory. So all this is a big extended TFT if you want. On the right hand side would be OPE if you do OP of some something which is not on the real one. Right, okay, so if I'm moving too far off the, in the complex plane for this P1 and P2, uh, the, this OP will start having these two terms in, in, in addition to the integral. So you have to divide it by analytic continuation. So this uh, is not for UV theory. I'm told you that's uh, a good moment to make a pause before defining more complicated uh, things like minimal models. Uh, before the break. Okay, so 10 minutes break.
quoi une délégation On va peut-être attendre le retour de la délégation. Ok, so let's start again with eight series minimal model. So eight series, which in other words means diagonal minimal model. So the idea is to look for rational CFT. So rational. Uh, means uh, having finitely many primary sheets. So now let me make another assumption with which I hope you'll find plausible, which is that a rational diagonal CFT on the sphere. is equivalent to Finite set of degenerate implementation, which is closed under fusion. The definition of rational is that a, is that it has a finite number of primaries. Yes. And can we show that this implies that the primaries have rational conformal dimensions? Um, okay, there are arguments, but I'm not sure they are so general. Uh, they probably would anyway require modular invariance. So I think here I'm focusing on the sphere. So uh, probably you can't show that they have rational dimensions. Using modular invariance. Yeah, but you know, we derive it by assuming we get only detriment fields, basically. And vice versa, like, can you say if you assume that you're, you only have uh, uh, representations with rational dimensions, can you show that then you must have a finite number of primaries? No, but you cannot show that because it's, it's wrong. Ah, okay. And uh, what was the counterexample? Well, you take any model like, well, uh, Group model at rational uh, central charge, for example, all the dimensions are rational. And it has an infinite uh, number of primaries. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe then what people would Maybe. But uh, minimal models are not, are not unitary in general. Okay, so let's accept this uh, claim uh, and look for some set of uh, digit fields which find something, but closed on the fusion. So we know already that if we start with G12, in general, you generate really too many sheets, so, so that's a bad start. But uh, that's because we were doing it at generic central charge. So now, if Rational central charge, we can have uh, multiply, well, fully degenerate fields with several node vectors which vanish, and that will give us more constraints. So the claim uh, now is that we need to take theta squared uh, rational and to look at fully degenerate fields. Uh, so there are two cases whether it's positive or negative. So let me start with the case of beta squared negative, which means, well, the central charge is more than 25. Uh, then uh, let's look at the simplest fully degenerate field we can have, which is Vf1 uh, q plus 1. It's fully degenerate because it has a null vector here at level qb plus 1, but also a null vector at level p plus 1. So then if we start to fuse this field with itself, do we get finitely or infinitely many fields? Well, that's a that's an exercise you can do using this, this fusion rules, basically. In particular, you can show that this field that we call V, so V times V, gives you V11, which is only simply degenerate, plus a V2, P plus 1, 1. 
And well, actually, if you do it again, you'll see that the first index, I mean, is nothing bouncy. You can still get infinitely many sheets. Uh, so, although it's not a theorem, I think it's the general situation for beta squared negative. You can't get a finite set of uh, the sheets that closes on the fusion. So I'm going to focus on the other case of, of, of beta positive, which means c less than one. So uh, here we really want to start with v12 and v21 and see what we get by repeated fusion. And um, so v1 v2. So the claim is that we get the cat table. So first I make the claim and then I uh, argue that it's true, or I don't prove it. So what is the cat table? It's the set of R and S which belongs to, so let me call it K to Q. So now beta squared is Q over P, with P and Q positive in table, co prime as well. So let me define the cat table as ju just 0p times 0q intersection n times n. Which means, in fact, uh, the following. So in the RS plane, I'm starting with 1 and stopping at p minus 1. Here I'm starting at 1, stopping at q minus 1. So the cat table is the set of opposite points with integral co coordinates. And the nice thing is first that if you are in the cat table, it means you are uh, multiply degenerate. Well, I'm assuming you are from my field. I hope you don't mind. So the term V S, so I'm calling it S like fully degenerate because V S R S is V S P minus one Q minus S. So it has two, well in fact it has infinitely many uh, vanishing even vectors. Okay, so I have to compute the OPE of fields of, of this type. And to do that, I mean, it's going to deduce from the general of e, which is here. So, but first, in fact, we have to, um, the, the set of fields we can obtain is a subset of this set here, because we have to obey the constraints from having uh, null vectors here at level R1 S1 and here at level R2 S3. So therefore, Vs R1 S1 Vs R2 S2 is included in this sum here, starting from R1 minus R2 S1. But then, uh, I, I mean, by uh, assumption, my definite field here, oops, I mean, this expression, well, let me rewrite it here. I have V R S equals V P minus R Q minus S. So it also has an extra null vector at, uh, at this level, P minus R times Q minus S. And this means that the OPE, the same OPE also has to be included in what I would get by replacing R1 by P minus R1, R2 by P minus R2, etc. So that's the sum. R1 minus R2 plus 1, and then 2P minus R1 minus R2 minus 1. So here I'm just doing R1 P minus R1, and uh, R2 P minus R2, and the same for S. Is fixed here. So sum S equals S1 minus S2 S1 and 2Q minus R S1 
מאפס טו מאפס וואן פי אס מאפס So now I have basically to take the intersection of these two sets of uh, the Tennessee, but okay, I have to take the intersection modulo this identification. I mean, I could have field in principle which are equal here, although they have in fact different indices. But this in fact does not happen because if P and Q are co-prime, one of them must be odd. Let's say P is odd. And here, if you look at the first index R, And the first index here, they are all, modulo 2, they are all equal to the same number. Uh, but if you, if you do a P minus R, you change the parity of that index. So basically you can't have this field equals this field except if they, if they have the same indices exactly. They cannot be uh, reflected at one another. So therefore, in fact, the OP you get by taking the intersection is just well the sum here are up to the mean of these two numbers, which is, well, mean R1 plus R2, 2P minus R1 minus R2, minus 1. There is the sum of the, over the S index, which is R, D, S, R. Okay, so now the nice thing of having a mean here is that now we see that you get only fields in the cat table if you started inside the cat table, if our two fields are in the cat table, because well, this R now runs until this number, but this number uh, has to be at most P. So the cat table itself is stable on the fusion. That's the first conclusion. Uh, then I should show that these fields are in fact fully degenerate. By taking a product of two fully degenerate fields, I also get a fully degenerate field. And that's an exercise which uh, I think we can probably skip. Give you a, a hint. So, if you remember, we detect degenerate fields because they're OP with some generic field is finite. Well, the finite number of primary fields appear here. And so the claim is that now um, VFRS with RS in the cat table times DP, the result is zero. So that's what you should show based on the fusion rules of this field which you can compute by, again, taking the intersection of the fusion rules for indices R and S with the fusion rules for indices P minus R, Q minus P. You will find nothing is left. And then if you know that, then of course, if you take a product of two fully degenerate fields, well, you have to find, by associative key of the OP, you have to find more fully degenerate fields. So this allows us to define the minimal model, so let's call it AMMCQ by spec group, which is where the set of fields in the cat table fully degenerate with RS belonging to the cat table. But here I have the one half, which uh, due to this ambiguity here of reflection, and now I just have to specify if the of P and Q are allowed. Well, let me remind you, it was P and Q positive integers, P and Q co-prime, and well, we can assume P less than Q by symmetry between P and Q. So we know the spectrum and we know the fusion rules here. So other questions on this uh, minimal model? Well, if not, let's, uh, let's do what we now usually do when we build a new CFT, meaning taking limits to try to build even more CFT. So what limit uh, could we take? Well, this is a need of 
fille en dessous, et ça c'est les filles de moins d'une vitesse quoi des filles de aussi. So we have any, basically almost any rational number here. For this beta squared, we can take a non-rational limit. So the first question is what happens when beta squared goes to, well, when, let's say, when q over p goes to some beta zero squared, which does not necessarily belong to q. And then, it really depends how you take the limit. So you should think of what you do with the indices r and s now. So if r and s are fixed, What happens? Well, it means you are taking some fully decimal field, BRS, and you want to take its limit, well, just the limit in the central charge, so theta squared goes to theta zero squared. So your fully degenerate field sits somewhere in the cat table, and then the cat table, when Q and P go to infinity, so the cat table starts to become infinite, your field doesn't much care about that, but What happens is that it's, I mean, it has a null vector table Rs, which still exists in the limit, but then it has the other null vector, which is at level P minus R, Q minus S, which goes to infinity, and so it disappears. So, of course, you obtain a degenerate field now with only a null vector at level S. Since at generic central charge, you don't have multiple degenerate fields. So if you take the limit of the full model by this, uh, I mean this limit, so uh, q over p goes to beta zero squared and r and s goes to uh, fixed, sorry. Well, what do you find? Generalized normal. Right. You find the generalized minimal model. So you find the, the spectrum is made of all the Uh, there's no field because now your cut table and it has become infinite. The, the boundaries have gone to infinity, so you're left with all possible indices R and S, all possible integers. The, the only like the only way to do this, so so unitary minimal models have P equals cube Q plus one. Right. So basically the only uh, irrational point that you can approximate with the unitary ones is beta squared equal to one. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah, but you, you can do that even for a rational beta zero squared, in fact. You don't have to assume it's non-rational. But if you do this for like beta squared equals one, do you approach a rational CFP or what, what do you approach? No, 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 you still approach, I, I would say, the uh, minimal model at, C, at central charge one, which I'm not fully sure exists, so I'm not sure it has been really studied. Um, yeah, one has to check if there are not any subtleties. Okay, so now that was easy, so that was, but now let's do a limit where R and S um, are not fixed. So one reason to do that is that, well, if beta squared now is no longer rational, then C R S we know it can go to any value, basically, when R and S go to infinity. We can send it to some fixed number, so we could get, in principle, any diagonal field. So, the limit now of Cs Rs when, when Crs goes to some p, we still have p goes to beta zero squared, well, gives us a generic diagonal field, and therefore, I would expect the limit of our a series minimal model to be a unit series with, uh, well, p less than one. Well, to do that, I, I still I have to check that in fact uh, I get uh, the correct operator product expansion. But if you look at the operator product expansion, you will find uh, basically uh, any uh, any uh, all of these fields with real moment disappear in the OPs when you take the limit. So you also recover the correct OPs. Okay. 
Right, yeah, they are known. Uh, and you can make a limit and get the DOCD formula out of it. Well, it's not DOCD because it's still uh, a one, so it's a different formula, but yes, you can you can get it. Yeah, yeah that works at level of three point functions, yes. Is there a formula that's like one over DOCC? To some extent, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now there is a big subtlety, which is that, in fact, it, you don't have to get into theory because uh, you can fine tune the parameters and do something else, provided the beta zero squared is rational. So let me quickly explain that. So, in the case beta zero squared is q zero over q zero, um, then what you could do is to first you could fine tune p and q by assuming. Um, QP0 minus QQ0 equals 1. Right? So that's really a lot of fine tuning because if you want Q over P to have the correct limit, all you have to do is to take QP0 minus QQ0, well, much less than uh, P at P and Q go to infinity. But now you don't uh, just assume they are much less than p, you don't assume they are square root of other square root of p, you really assume they are fixed to 1. So that's a, a lot of fine tuning already. But it's the same you wanted to do with your unitary minimal model, in fact. Mm -hmm. And in addition, I want to fine tune uh, R and S as well. So to motivate that, let me write P R S uh, when we take this limit with. P and uh, Q uh, fine tuned like that. So P R S following, uh, I can write it as square root one over square root two P uh, one over two square root P zero P zero times R Q zero minus S P zero plus uh, one half R over P plus S over Q plus something of order P minus two. So here I'm taking the formula for PRS. So you see, originally PRS is just uh, one half square root Q over QR minus the square root P over QS. And I'm uh, taking P and Q. Uh, um, I'm expanding P and Q near their uh, limit values, Q0 over Q0. So I'm expanding, well, I'm expanding Q over P equals Q0 over Q0 plus something of order 1 over P. So this is the result of this expansion of PRS. Um, so if I do that, No, I, I, let me do my fine tuning of R and S. So let me assume that R uh, Q0 minus S Q0 is fixed. And let me assume also that R over P and S over Q both have finite limits and it's the same limit X. So if I do that, the limit of P R S, so this is, let me call that N. If I do that, P R S in the limit is, is, is this N plus S. Well, X, the number between 0 and 1, N by definition is an integer. Well, not necessarily positive. So it looks like I have reconstructed any uh, real number here in a very special and fine-tuned way. But uh, the thing is, if you do this special limit in the fusion rules, well, you won't find uh, the trivial fusion rules of Fermi's theory, which were dp1, dp2, equals one half integral dp. No, here you have nothing from the fusion rules of 
minimal model. So that was VR1, S1, VR2, S2, which was from, well, it was, there was a mean there. R1 plus R2, 2P minus R1 minus R2 minus 1. So you start from this fusion rules and you do this type of thing. And the claim is that you find the fusion rules DP1, DP2 equals, um, so you, uh, well, sorry, it starts with the uh, sum. For n, n1 plus n2 plus t0 plus q0 plus qz, and then you have an integral over x1 minus x2 to the 2 minus x1 plus x2, and then you have vnx, which is the limit, the limit vrs is some vnx. So basically, if you do it carefully, the, this uh, non-trivial bounds in this sum here will give rise to non-trivial bounds in this integral of x1 minus x2 to 2 minus x1 plus x2. And therefore, you don't get an integral of all possible momentums on the right. You get only part of them. And so you get a, a, a CFD, which is not unique theory, because it has non-trivial fusion rules. This is known, this thing. Yeah, it's more or less known. Uh, not very well known, but it's known. So let me give it name at least. I, I would call it a Runkel watch type CFD. Because Runkel and Watt in 2001 found the first example, which was at C equals one, by taking limit of unitary minimal model. But their construction works because, uh, because their, their beta squared was one, was rational. But the similar construction works for any rational beta squared. So this type of CFT, so now let, let me look at the complex plane. Let's, uh, so we take a limit of minimal model. The central charge goes to you know, some rational limit, T0. Um, we get this non-trivial uh, room what type CFT. Now, there is another way to get it, which would be from Lewy theory at complex central charge. And again, you have to fine tune the limit a bit to get there, but it can be done. But only rationals, but less than one. Yes. Now, the, well, this claim can look um, a bit paradoxical because the new bit theory has uh, trivial fusion rules, right? I mean, which I wrote uh, again uh, somewhere. I mean, in Lubin theory, dp1, dp2 gives you all uh, possible, an integral of all possible momentum. But here I'm claiming that in the limit, I only get a subset of that. So how can this be? Well, the, the point is that in the limit, it's the structure constant here, which appears in the Ophili, which, which has zeros. So you, you reconstruct these fusion rules by looking at at whether the UV structure constant goes to zero or not. So the, in, this, in the limit, if you want, as a function of P, uh, the UV structure constant, CP, P1, P2, will, uh, will have things behavior like that. It's, it's some nice function, smooth function, and then suddenly it falls to zero in some interval. And then it starts again and falls to zero in some other interval. These intervals correspond to uh, the place where the, the momentum switch don't appear in this field. And 
So this function, this OP coefficients, are also some like analytic continuation of the GOCC basically. Uh, yes, basically yes. So you you can you can get them either from Liouville with C less than one or from GOCC. And so the, the DOCC formula has this like non-analytic behavior in this uh, for C less than one. Yeah, right. So the DOCC formula in principle does not have any limit when C goes to this uh, half line. Mm -hmm. But if you take a limit in a special way and if your target is rational, then it will come past this limit, but it's no longer smooth. It's no longer continuous. The distribution rules of the Kelbats that you wrote there, the BP1, BP2 equals this sum. Yes. So if the spectrum is continuous, the BP1 and BP2 are continuous, how can you have a discrete fusion rule? So it's not really discrete. I mean, here we have this integral. What is discrete is only the value of n of the integral part of, uh, of, this, uh, of this momentum here. So the, the momentum you get for this phi t and x is just. Uh, this expression with n the integral part and x the fractional part. Oh, okay, there's a sum and an integral. Yeah, yeah there is a sum of an integral. Yeah, no, 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 it's a sum of integral. The sum is over n and the integral is over x. Okay, there's two, and then the ba those two numbers are the bounds of the integral. Yeah, right, x1 minus x2 and 2 minus x1 plus x2. Okay. Momentum N1 plus well, it has this momentum here, but now I'm labeling it by n and x instead of labeling it by its momentum. Okay. Yeah, sorry, that was maybe a bit quick. Yeah, you will have more details in the notes about that. Yeah. X. So what what values that ah x is in zero one, but it's yeah. never zero because it's an open interval. Um, if you want. So you see that these bounds, in fact, prevent it from reaching zero because the lower bound is, well, modulus, uh, absolute value of x1 minus x2, well, except if x1 is x2, in fact. I'm just wondering if, it, if, if you choose this bx to, to be zero, if you can have also a small. The um, rule will have some discrete part where the x is zero, but it has sum over n, and then a continuous part for x uh, different than zero. So that may be uh, no, I, I don't think so. Okay, but let me let's move on because I mean, this is a very nice, I think, CFT, but also not the most important one because this is the assumption of central charge. It's a bit uh, a bit special. <laughs> so I, I'd like to. To move on to non-diagonal CFTs now. Okay, one last question. So these function matches, do they have any like statistical physics application? Well, not not as far as I know. So non-diagonal CFTs now. I'm still keeping two degenerate P. So. Uh, the first one is D series minimal model. So we want to build rational non diagonal CFT. And our basic assumption is that we use the same representations as we did in A series minimal model. So we, we start with the cap table. So in this is in the cap table. And we want the left dimension to be the cap table, the right dimension to also be the cap table. Uh, which means if we write our non diagonal piece as DRS, in fact, we want delta RS to be equal to some delta, let's say, R1S1, which with R1S1 in the cap table. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that RS belongs to the cap table because we have identities. Uh, in particular, we have this identity, delta Rs equals delta R plus C over 2, S plus Q over 2. Okay. So the cat table is nice, but it has a big problem for us, which is, is not invariant under the reflection of S goes to minus S. So our non-diagonal fields, if you remember, they have on the left 
delta r x, and on the right, delta r minus x. And so if r is in the cat stable, r minus s is not in the cat stable. But I have to use this uh, now this uh, identity to uh, rectify this situation. So my uh, the idea is that we we can take r s in a shifted cat stable. Let's say when we look at the center of the cat stable, which is at p over two, p over two. And that's where we start to measure our, our R and S. If we measure from here, the cap table becomes invariant on the S goes to minus S. Uh, so what this means concretely is that we take R S to belong to uh, the following set, so minus P over 2, P over 2, intersection Z plus P over 2, times uh, minus q over 2, q over 2, intersection z plus q over 2. So that's the basic term that. And if I do that, uh, both the left and right dimensions coincide with dimensions from the cat table. So uh, now I have to check that the spin is still integer. So what is the spin? Well, the point is that R is a. Uh, is Q over 2 modulo integer, and then is Q over 2 modulo integer. So P and Q are co prime integers. So if both of them are odd, then I'm cooked because Rs will be typically uh, one quarter or something. So I have to take one of them to be even. I can't take both of them to be even, otherwise they would not be co prime. So let's take, uh, by convention, uh, P to be even. And Q, therefore, has to be odd. And then the integral spin condition, it, well, it's still Rs belongs to Z. Now Q being odd, uh, it, it implies 2R, uh, uh, no, sorry, R must be an even number. And S, of course, will be will belong to one half to Z. If you want to minus R S S for the half integral, and if you can uh, do it today, do you have to extend the integer, make a half integer? Well, to be half integer indeed is a constraint from uh, the existence of the 